gracious invitation. We really appreciate those of you who, who've come and uh, form our audience today. We have two major competing events that have taken others who've sent their regrets. The four C's, where, where is it? St. Louis. The composition folks are off, <clears throat> who are very much interested in the work of several of the folks with us. They're off um, heading to St. Louis and the film and media studies. People are off to a conference in Boston. But we're really just very happy to have you with us. And we're having a grand old time being reunited. And it really is fun. So Walter, thank you for, for that as well, the chance to be back together. And I wanted to mention that while I did the work directly with Ian and with Sherry, the others also had mentors, different mentors. And so we all worked together to get somewhere. I just wanted to say something very short in the way of introduction about Haystack. And then as we switch over from speaker to speaker, I'll just say a little bit about you individually, just to embarrass you with large ass and <laughs> more large ass, right? Um, when I'm on the executive board of Haystack, the International Humanities, Art, Science, Technology, Advanced Collaboratory, in the early aughts of the 2000, Haystack began forming and trying to get some traction as an organization, particularly virtually based, that would be supportive of new digital media and learning, new technologies. And uh, <clears throat> we're not having internet cooperation today, but it's real easy to get to our website, haystack.org. Is it cooperating now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. And so, well, at any rate, you can go to our website. And what we originally did, when State became involved, we're a haystack. Oh, thank you, Ian. Your magic is always. If we became involved when, in 2006, Kathy Davidson, the co-founder of Haystack, asked me if we would be a model campus in the Information Year series that Haystack was holding at the time. The idea was that going around the country each month, a campus would be featured that was doing new breakthrough work, etc. We didn't know quite what to do at first, but we wound up premiering a couple of projects that were going on in the English department. Steve Shavero and Jeff Rice shared their work, and as, as a matter of fact, it was the first time we did anything with Second Life on our campus, so that was exciting. And we particularly featured the digital collections of the library, which are quite astonishing, the digital projects. <coughs> so we had quite a number of things to celebrate. Not long thereafter, we, in our board meetings, our annual board meetings for Haystack, started talking about this really curious idea of having something called the Haystack Scholar. And we thought, well, wouldn't it be neat if we had people sponsoring Haystack Scholars on individual campuses to really help a new generation of professionals incubate, to support them, nurture them? And we didn't know if the idea would die. We, we wondered if we'd even have any respondents. Well, the first year we had over a hundred. We've got 200 people rumbling through right now. As Haystack Scholars, we have been just exhilarated. And one of the things we're happy about, too, is that we find that we've got grad students out there now in the market who can use the fact that they've been Haystack Scholars to leverage their candidacy. So we have just been completely thrilled by how this program has gone. We, so we've had, in Haystack, we've had two major projects. We're associated with two major projects recently. We get $2 million a year from the MacArthur Foundation's Digital Media and Learning Initiative, and we give away most of it for projects. That funding will be ending in 2014, and we're actually thinking right now about doing some new kinds of configurations for the profession centered on the Haystack Scholars. So this has just been an absolutely glorious experience for us, and I'm just so thrilled that particularly the library and the English department have been so supportive of having Haystack Scholars on our campus. It's not a huge stipend, but it's an honor that we've really treasured, and we're so glad to see so many things happening. I just wanted to <clears throat> embarrass, could you go to the next step? Ian's our arrow guy. Connor can't be with us today because of some unforeseen schedule problems, but he's one of the newest Haystack Scholar. He's working with Jeff Pruthnick in the English department. So he's a PhD candidate in English and doing work in composition and rhetoric. He's also a grad teaching assistant in the department where he teaches technical communications. And he's got a, he's co-author of a piece called Interfaces and Infrastructures, which is on examining new media objects in English studies, the part, in the English studies classroom. That will be appearing in pedagogy. 
And he also is part of his Haystack Scholar work. Uh, there are a variety of projects you'll hear about that people do. <clears throat> He's researching Aristotelian rhetoric, public sphere theory, theories of the commons, and new media and technology studies. <laughs> Sounds like a lot. Um, but his dissertation project is going to focus on the historical progression of the idea of the commons, and then extending it to thinking about the classroom as a commons, a common space. So that's a very exciting connection and a media commons theoretical framework that he's generating and using that then as a pedagogical model for teaching with and through technology. So he can't be with us. Mary can't be with us either because she's on her way to the Four Seas Conference. She has some early work she has to get there to do for a workshop. Thank you. And But Mary has is a repeat offender. She's a second, <laughs> second year as Haystack Scholar working. She's been working with Jeff Krupnik and <clears throat> Francis Rainey. So lots of support there. And we are very pleased that she participated in one of the virtual forums of Haystack that Kim is going to represent. So <clears throat> one of the things that evolved over time with the Haystack Scholars Program was the idea of monthly or near monthly um, online forums, because we're very much committed to having a virtual collaboratory, trying to create a different kind of meeting place. So <clears throat> I'm going to let these folks go ahead and tell you about the projects that we're doing. We're doing this in sort of a uh, modified lightning talk style, in eight to ten minutes, we told ourselves each. But we can, stop, we can um, certainly have plenty of time for discussion, and we really haven't resolved, do we have these the PPT set up in any particular order for our speakers? It, it's in the order that it's listed. So okay. That's, but Andy so had also suggested sure. chronology, but that's okay. So Walter gave very gracious introductions to everybody, but I, I get to make my embarrassing counts. I didn't get to work with Andy directly. You'll talk about who you worked with. You'll just mention who you worked with <clears throat> and your own project. But I've had the joy the last two summers of working with Andy as a grad research assistant. So. Uh, which is going to make my book, if it ever comes to pass, very much stronger than it was before. And it's just been glorious for me not only to have the assistance, but someone to talk to, a colleague really, to talk to you back and forth about this stuff. So welcome <laughs> again. <laughs> it's yours. Yeah. Thank you, Julie uh, and Walter. Um, so, uh, for the suggestion. Um, when I was a Haystack Scholar, I was working with Richard Grusin while he was still here. Um, and I was actually doing a, a slightly different, um, working on a piece that got published in Reconstruction recently, but it was about cell phones and kind of how we're dealing with them. And so, but uh, the sort of argument there about how we deal with objects and sort of um, make arguments with them, the way they persuade our use of them, is something that I'm um, carrying forward into this larger project. And I'm going to just present um, a little bit of my dissertation, and, and uh, I'm working with Richard Marbach again out of the English department um, on that. So, um, so Robert Beauregard writes, "quote Urban decline exists because we have made it so." End quote. And what I take from Beauregard's point is that the language we use to describe cities can unnecessarily limit how our city fabrics function and whether they succeed. The fabric of a city, as I'm defining it, is made up of the relationships between media objects, devices, spaces, and agents that inform, either through persuasion, inspiration, or coercion, how we carry out our daily lives. The fact that we continue to feel unsure about how to take action in cities such as Detroit comes from the fact that our descriptions of them do not match the ways that we are using their changing fabrics. <clears throat> this mismatch arises when our actions demonstrate a presumption of seamlessness between media, so that we move carelessly between physical buildings social and augmented media, and reactive music, just to name a few. And this type of movement is at odds with the persistence of medium-specific languages, talking about architecture only with the language of architects, or talking about digital media only with the language of programmers. Such rigid specificity predetermines perspectives, questions, and narratives that are inadequate to deal with the multimedia fabric of today's cities. My research addresses this mismatch between our actions in cities and the language we use to describe them. I show that to be responsible citizens, we make the most informed choices, we must first reconnect what we are saying, what we are doing, in the diverse but intertwined media of our cityscapes. So one example of this multimedia fabric appeared in July of 2010, when the anonymous street artist Banksy created a piece of graffiti at the old Packard plant in Detroit. 
It shows a young person holding a can of paint with a brush and standing next to the phrase, I remember when all this was trees, which is also kind of a nice little point when you can see trees kind of growing in the background of the space anyways. Um, the location of I remember was first identified on a large scale through the online communities who recognized the Packard plant from an image on Banksy's website. Uh, I remember in the cinder block wall it was painted on was later cut out and removed by the 555 gallery, a local art gallery and artist community so that it could be preserved and put on public display. The three instances of I remember in the factory, online, and in the gallery are in fact different versions, different iterations of the same art. At first blush, they appear to be the same. They are, after all, the same image, just repeated in different spaces. But when we see them as iterations or variations on a theme, then together they express a flickering quality of a new type of city fabric, one that we can use to bridge how we are talking about cities and how we are participating in them. We can see the potential and necessity for new city languages and artifacts such as I remember, where we struggle to describe, let alone interact with, something that is anchored simultaneously in the different media spaces and communities of a factory, online, and in the gallery. It is crucial that we work to make the change, uh, this change happen because the distressed and confused condition that is taking place in post-industrial cities also affects the narrative we can create about ourselves. Therefore, if Beauregard states, urban decline exists because we have made it so, then by the same logic, a post-urban rebirth of cities is similarly within our reach. And what's more, it's our responsibility as citizens today. So that's kind of sort of the general thrust of the argument that I'm making. And where I want to go here for the, just the rest of my talk is to sort of present a challenge to everybody. Um, so after today, uh, and you leave, I encourage you to be mindful about how you are moving through the city fabric. With this discussion of flickering cities in mind, I challenge you to examine from two perspectives the objects and spaces you interact with most on a daily basis. First, reflect on the spaces that you are moving through after you leave here and go to your office, your car, a social media website, or your email inbox. How do you describe these spaces? What clues do they give you for how to act in them? Where do you see moments of repetition, perhaps in the communities you participate in, online and face-to-face, -face, or the types of spaces you move through digitally and physically. My second challenge to you is to consider how you have produced or contributed to your environment recently. What changes have you made to your environment? You rearranged the room, uh, maybe you bought a plant, maybe you uh, built something, a piece of furniture. Uh, how have you adapted your space to better fit your needs? What sort of trial and error process did you go through before it felt right? Failing to be critical of the ways different media are coming together means that we are in danger of being exploited by the people, objects, devices, and spaces around us. For example, it would be easy to see the iterations of I remember as interchangeable, but to do so would mean that we have been fooled into thinking that one type of space can be substituted for another, or that physical and digital spaces would work harmoniously if we just match them together. If we do not work actively to question how different iterations are at best persuading and at worst manipulating our actions, and we are carrying out our daily lives with a diminished understanding of why we are acting in particular ways. Just as I remember repeats or flickers in multiple media at the same time, our participation in, in its different iterations, uh, and reflecting on that participation means that citizenship itself is now iterative. Relationships that we construct with material artifacts are malleable and flex to accommodate our changing needs. We take on different roles and develop different definitions of citizenship as we go through our days, and interact with different elements of the city's fabric. Putting iterations into conversation with one another does not assume that we will arrive at a totalized or complete understanding of an artifact. Instead, through our negotiations, we are acknowledging the spaces and communities that we are choosing to ignore, out of necessity, as we work to describe and engage with the elements that are most relevant to us. In the first challenge, I ask you to reflect on the different media and spaces with which you interact. In the second challenge, I ask you to consider how you contribute to the shaping of your environment. My own engagement, I remember, illustrates one opportunity for how we might be productive in the poster of the city. The writing I've done about this artifact is another iteration of I remember that brings the communities and arguments of textual space into conversation with the spaces and communities of the factory, the web, and the gallery. This process of productive iteration is not a one-time operation. Once we begin creating iterations, we are responsible for the effects and of the ideas, objects, and relationships that we put out into the world. The productive process of iteration is intimately wedded to the reflective process of iteration that I described above, 
and we must continually reassess our designs and redesigns to test if they are still appropriate for their situations and see how they might be impacting other people, objects, devices, and spaces. To be productive in iterative art with iterative artifacts means first understanding that objects and spaces can be inoperative in two ways, and we are fully capable of dealing with both. On the one hand, an operative can mean a physical or mechanical failure of an object or space. On the other hand, an operative can also mean that the design of an object or space does not correctly conform to how I want to use it. And for this conversation, we describe our inability to participate in the city of Detroit in particular ways. The tacit knowledge we have developed from using objects and spaces all our lives give us the intuition, expectations, and skills to begin changing our environments to better suit our needs. So looking again, I remember we might say that the city itself is an operative under the first definition of physical or mechanical failure because it cannot readily support the relationships, the fabrics that uh, are necessary to be called a city. But this view does not give us any suggestions about how to move forward because it assumes that any answer will also be physical, an assumption that ignores the wealth of options other media can offer. Instead, to understand the city as a design problem <coughs> takes advantage of the flickering quality of its multimedia fabric. Such an understanding means seeing that the new relationships created across media extend the space and time of the city in ways never, be, never before possible. Engaging with iterations is an active and productive process of putting artifacts and arguments out into our cities, testing their usefulness and appropriateness and redesigning them as necessary. In sum, your participation in cities today is about being mindful of and proactive in the different iterations you participate with in your environment. By recognizing and changing uh, the changing and increasing the repetitious nature of our cities, we can refuse to uncritically accept the divorce between the ways we talk about and the ways we move through the multimedia fabric of our cityscapes. And by working to connect our voices and our actions, we can better understand the roles that we must play in our political cities. Thank you. This is a wonderful example, and uh, I would like to extend an invitation right now for some variant on this contribution to a wonderful conference that's coming in 2013 to the Wayne State campus, in large part thanks to Renee Hoogland, who's very active in the Humanities Center in the English Department. On It's the Arts of the Present Conference. It's going to focus on Detroit as a city and the tropes of ruins and a lot of other themes. So this would be a, a beautiful example of scholarship that's appropriate to that and then drawing on a digital medium. Let me just use a variant on the lightning talk pattern and ask if anyone would like to ask one burning question, then we'll delay a fuller discussion. But anybody got a burning question? Hi, Joe. <coughs> to ask Andy, perhaps? Or if it's just simmering, it might come to full. <coughs> okay, well, let's go ahead and go on to Ian and to embarrass Ian. Uh, when we first got the idea of having digital humanities of collaboratory and haystack scholars. I asked Dean Amin, who was then Director of New Media and Information Technology, who'd be a good person to invite to become a haystack scholar, our first haystack scholar. And Ian was the name she came up with, and it was really delightful because you brought in that perspective from art history and also the retraining of the 21st century librarian, which I hope you'll reference, so that you bring uh, multiple perspectives there. And while I was still trying in a very clumsy way to figure out what the collaboratory might be, I really appreciated your candor in saying what might or might not work. The collaborator, collaboratory has since morphed from being an events-based group to more of a research group with particularly librarians and digital media learning. But you are the first one and the multi-layers of your talent and your intelligence makes such a great launching point for us. Well, that's very flattering. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. And uh, Dr. Adams for keeping this good se great series going on. Um, while I was involved with the, um, the Haystack program in the first place, I was uh, pursuing an art, uh, an art librarianship degree uh, sponsored by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And uh, a lot of the work that I did was working with cultural institutions and uh, converting uh, kind of outdated media into, uh, into digital media and what the implications were <coughs> and how you the shift from <coughs> one media format to not only another media format, but a different form of delivery from a tangible to a kind of an intangible way. And uh, also worked with uh, the, uh, 
Michigan Opera Theater and the Art and Art History Department. And uh, when when Julie uh, asked me to, to, to speak today, I, I kind of thought about um, my work right now is as a systems integrator, which, you know, what, what the heck is that? Uh, it, and anything can be a system. It's kind of a part librarian, part IT professional working within the arts and humanities. So I, I get to, to play with a lot of notions and technologies that oftentimes aren't super interesting to those that aren't, you know, in, embedded in them themselves. So I was kind of inspired by this kind of tragic email that I got from Germany, and uh, I don't know, can't really read it too well, but um, from my supplier of uh, the digitizing software that I prefer to use, uh, which controls pretty much any digitizing equipment uh, a little bit better than what comes with the, the hardware that they were no longer going to be supplying worldwide at all Kodachrome targets with which to calibrate any of our equipment. And this kind of served for me as a, th this demise of Kodachrome somehow, for me, marked a really strong uh, signpost for the, the, the end of the industrial era in kind of image production and, and consumption. So I just wanted to share today a few musings that were brought about by this, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, initially received as being a tragic email, and, and th these are the things that I wouldn't we wouldn't be able to get anymore. You can see it's from 09, uh, printed on Kodachrome. This is a calibration target which you're able to scan and it's able to assign numeric values to all of the colors so that different characteristics of each kind of film that you use uh, is able to be converted into uh, an accurate fashion to, to, into digital media. Kodachrome really kind of captured the world's popular imagination. We have you know, pop songs written about some kind of you know, media capture device. It's just, it seems so strange. And, and Kodachrome's done been taken away at this point. It lasted, uh, <laughs> it lasted from 1935 to uh, 2009, 2010. You know, reports vary from when they actually stopped making this stuff. But and you can see from the image on the left, and you know, a more well-calibrated projector would be showed a little bit better, but I'm willing to bet almost everybody in this room knows what, where this image came from and has some kind of connection to it. Um, the, the way that we view the world and kind of think of pictures and picture making, how we construct the world around us based on, on imagery, is largely based on, on the Kodachrome's ability to capture that visual reality in a certain fashion. Um, and that's that's gone now. And but what exactly is gone? Uh, I just want to show you a couple of technical uh, diagrams here. Uh, this the colors here is the visual visible spectrum. This is what we can see in the world around us when we walk around, anything we take in, we, we can see all of this. The what is what you can capture on in a digital device, theoretically, is this inscribed triangle, this yellow one. What you can capture in a kind of a meaningful way that can go from device to device is this other inscribed triangle, the white one. Uh, this black one is what you can transfer over the internet. Kodachrome is able to capture, you know, greens and reds and you know these interesting purples in ways that, that no other media was really outside of special technical and uh, medical uh, films in a, in a way that, that, that we, we can't really get anymore. So this is this is what this is what we're losing. Um, that and you know, we all we all can kind of recognize. You know, it's one of the, the last rolls of Kodachrome. <laughs> of Kodachrome, and it has a certain cool factor too. Uh, you know, Kodak was able to, was really successful at branding. It's, in, in my mind, they're kind of like, you know, like the first Apple, you know, that was able to really capture how, how we deal with media and how we think about transmitting the media. Where there's, you know, special boxes for holding it, the carousels for putting into the machines to project it on uh, certain spaces. Uh, you know, that we can associate, you know, anti lean and anti rain. But also, um, also, uh, this is this is the way we've been able to uh, 
to, to teach with, with, with the slides uh, for, the, for the arts and humanities in particular. A um, little bit about the, the, the demise of Kodak. It's been in the news a lot lately. I didn't know if anybody had, had been following it at all, but you know, they're not totally out of business. They're right now kind of taking bids on their patents. They're selling all that. They're uh, not making um, consumer film anymore. They're shifting their business entirely to kind of being able to print things from, from digital media. But it's just a, an amazing uh, rate of decline. Is it the Wikipedia entry shows in 76 they had 90% market share of the photographic film sales in the United States. And while their film sales didn't go down as much as their inability to compete with the production of digital uh, capture devices. Uh, there, there's always been kind of this, this problematics of like where where photography fits in art and where it, it fits in documentary. I'm going to avoid the, the you know, whether it's art and how you know when and how it is art, but um, but it's it's always been useful as a form of uh, documentary and uh, capture of, of information. And there have been a lot of complaints now, and, and people can, uh, crying out, "We're never going to have the same quality." You know, what what are what are we losing here? when we can't see things the same way. It's just this lessening of standards. And this is by no means a new argument, especially in photography. This has been the argument in photography all along. Every time there's a transfer from one media to the next, there's an outcry. Well, this is terrible. And, and you know, it happened as early as, uh, well, Walter Benjamin points out in his uh, Brief history of photography in 1931. He complained about how photography had lost all, you know, its relevance and its quality uh, by 1860, once the industrial, once the industrial revolution uh, in, uh, enabled this, this processing in this outrageously simple fashion, which you know, almost nobody would even consider doing anymore. Um, just that transfer <coughs> made it no longer particularly uh, uh, a meaningful like, form of uh, communication. And continued along with that argument in '36, when he complains of in the, the very famous work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, that that it, it, it's producing a loss of aura of the work of art. It's 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 you know, ruining the way that humans can engage with the creative production of it, of their own humanity. And so this. This has been going, the same argument keeps being made that somehow we keep moving forward and, 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 and using this kind of visual media. It continues on, and, and uh, Roland Barthes complains in the, the camera Lucider observes that, you know, that each photograph is a catastrophe, even, because it, it'll, it'll capture, it, it's capable of capturing events that, and, and people that are within those photographs who are already gone or dead, whether that's good or bad. Uh, in the example of, of this, this photograph uh, from the Antarctica Kunst exhibition that the Nazis put on to show how terrible modern art was. But the, the gist of, of Bart's argument here is that it, it shows a catastrophe that is yet to occur and that we have no way of stopping and yet has already occurred. And the, the, a photograph has the ability to produce this, which I don't think is, is, is lost transfer to the digital media. But you know, these are all problems, but you know, this is this is the stuff that we have to use in the instruction of art and art, art history and a lot of the humanities as we move to uh, a digital a digital world. Um, so a lot of the work that I did in while uh, in the Haystack program here was um, I work in, for the visual resources collection in the Department of Art and Art History just down the hall. Where we have a collection, a teaching collection built up over the last 40 years of over 150,000 slides. Maybe five years ago, six years ago, we would re refile slides that were used. Maybe 6,000 a week would be would be in circulation. Uh, there's been maybe 120 slides in the last six months that have been that have been used. We've we've had to go from an exclusively um, slide-based instructional method to uh, almost exclusively digital method in a matter of a, couple, a few years. And um, you know, the, what are the implications? How do you do this? And being able to convert convert media is is one one element. Um, 
we have, we have a nice we have a lab over there that's fully calibrated, so we're able to capture as much out of the original image as possible. Although we've been reproducing, recreating the uh, the collection, it's now at about the same number. We have about the same number of digital images as we had uh, uh, slides at this point because there's a, the ability to share. And then this is this is what we're really gaining. We may lose the ability to get that red just right, but we can have access to so much more and richer materials now uh, in a way that, that never would have uh, would have been considered even you know a couple of decades ago. And and our our end mark, and we're still some faculty holding on to I'm not giving up my slides. Uh, well, 2005 put the end of that because Kodak stopped even making their industry standard ectographic pulse projector, and I bought up about 10 of them on eBay immediately <laughs> thereafter. Um, so it, it, there's, there's no going back. There's no going back at this point. So how do we, how do we move forward? And uh, what we gain in access, uh, you know, slides, slides degrade. You have to replace these things every 20 years or so. That, that was one of the beauties of uh, Kodachrome. That if it was stored nominally correctly, that would last over 50 years. And so you'd have a, a decent life on it. The problem with digital imagery is that although the image itself may not degrade, there's you know, some arguments about that, but the, uh, the inability to access it then becomes an issue. These things just disappear into thin air when you can no longer get a hold of them. Um, what can you do with them? Do they fit into the way that you're thinking and the way that you're trying to uh, write instruction or to do scholarship? Um, one of the one of the projects that I worked on with the, with the library was to perform crosswalks with the different collections that exist out there. What are their cataloging schemes that they're using to to, to gain access to these materials? How do we connect them through the information about them to make them somehow not only a accessible. Um, but meaningful to us, kind of as uh, as academics and as as humans, even. So at this point, we've we've been able to. Uh, at, the university has a digital asset management system that's been online for a few years now. I worked with the library system to kind of to implement this and to, to roll it out campus wide. You can get at the uh, the digital collections through the library system or through the art uh, through the art page at Wayne State. You can navigate through there, and it's showing uh, 136,000 images right now, which kind of varies depending on uh, which servers and different universities happen to be working nicely and playing with the system on that day. We may have more, we may have uh, we may have less, but all of the images there are uh, instrumental to the actual instruction of courses. We've, we've been able to get into our own institutional repository as well as uh, sharing amongst them. And uh, over in this area here, you can see how we, you can search by them, uh, by images, for any of the metadata fields that, that we put in there. The cataloging is a kind of a painstaking process, cr crosswalking between uh, different metadata schemas, and each image takes a while to catalog. But at that point, we're only, it's only cost us, it costs us labor. But looking to the future, this seems very cumbersome. This just happens to be what happens to work right now. Um, and if this is what's replacing Kodachrome, you know what's you know what's what's in the future. Um, you know the future and, and what's happening right now. There there's there's software out now that's prowling the internet. I think many of us have noticed if you use Google, if you search for images, over on the left hand side, you can be like, you know, no, I want ones that are red. That are that are like this, or ones that are that are like that, that are green, and they'll 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 filter the results accordingly. Well, there, there's software out there right now that's able to, and Photosynth, I can show just really quickly, um, is able to determine oops, determine what's out there, determine what the object is based entirely on an analysis of its visual content, and you're able to. For example, go and see uh, see as many images of Notre Dame as you'd like, and be able to pull different views. And it's just scrape it just scrapes the internet for you know there might be posters, um, high resolution, uh, professional photographs, camera phones, and kind of th this is these are the program this is programmers doing fun stuff. Um, what I think is fantastic about the Haystack group is that it's bringing the scholarship 
and the programmers and the technologists and making them all have the same, be on the same page, having the same dialogue so that this software, I mean, any anytime a new update for, you know, Microsoft Word comes out, it's like, damn, I have to, you know, where's this now? Um, the more that, that humanists are able to engage with the technology process, I think, the better off we're all going to be. And I, I think some of the, the greatest work in this area is going on with, um, uh, with, with red, in the field of rhetoric, uh, where it's just you know how do you you know how do you deal with information? There's so much information out there. There's more information than we've ever been able to, to have access to ever, and sometimes it's it's less understandable than ever. And finding ways to interact with that information, be it data driven, be it visual, have, finding ways for that to be meaningful to us in our lives and to make sense of the world around us is is really uh, you know exciting exciting for me, and it's something that I think that. That, that Haystack is, is really a part of, and provided me with uh, a lot of a lot of access to the people that are doing this kind of work, and a lot of like quick access to what people are thinking, what they're working on, and that's been that's been just uh, absolutely helpful to me. Uh, here, uh, other projects that are kind of in this same realm, I just wanted to share really quickly is. Um, like Google Street View type approach to art and art museums. We're now all pretty familiar with, you know, you get lots of the map and taking on the street view, you can see where you're at. Well, um, Google's done that with any number of uh, the world's top museums now, where you can do virtual walkthroughs in the museums and, um, and view uh, works of art, oftentimes at extremely high resolution. And enables, uh, inquiry into a, you know, a slide, sure, the, the, the color may be absolutely correct, but it's going to stay on the same format on whatever size screen you have, and you're going to see it as well as the, the room happens to be lit. And you're not going to be able to go in, let's see how much we are doing here, go in and actually examine that, that work in um, kind of a, a more meaningful, in a, in a more meaningful way. And this is the kind of stuff that, that we can that, that we, we exchange for the loss of certain uh, emulsion cap, uh, configurations on the film. Um, and I, I just want to think, is there a danger of this changing image format? I don't, I don't think it's as much, uh, I don't think that's as much the problem and the danger as some kind of nostalgia for the past. It's, it's, never, been, it's never been useful for us. And this here is what you can be nostalgic about when Thinking about Kodachrome, uh, there's a, a picture of, of Hong Kong from the what is that? Let's see, what kind of cover it is from the 40s, 50s. The um, you know th this is what happens. Um, there's still uh, before we you know kind of champion the loss of film and, and give it as a take it as a given. You know there's still a vibrant film culture. There's there's now uh, the Polaroid. When was the last time you saw Polaroid? And there's songs about those too. Um, there's, there, you can still get Polaroid film. There's the, the, the way the world is constructed right now, there's uh, some of the workers in the last uh, Polaroid factory in uh, the Netherlands just you know, bought up the place and like, you know what, we want to we keep this. We want to we keep it, having access to this. So you can still go on and get uh, 600 speed film or film for your X, SX70 if you happen to have one. Um, we, can, we can still do this. Uh, a friend of mine, a photographer here, uh, Ross Miller. I mean, he's been stockpiling some of like the world's last available open market reserves of the the film that was produced in the Eastern European Kodak factories that were built in the twenties. Uh, they're still that that were still making the same configuration of their emulsion as they were for the last sixty years. We have like forty thousand frames, forty six thousand frames, like yeah. stockpiled in a freezer, just kind of. Yeah. Keeping it going, and what I find to be like really fascinating is is you saw in the graph this increase in uh, digital capture devices started being superseded by phone digital capture devices, mm -hmm. and I just find it to be absolutely fascinating that some of the most popular ways now to share the photos the photos taken with with these kinds of devices are through <laughs> software whose icons look like this. They're emulating old camera technologies and are uh, and that are that are applying to these these clean, beautiful digital images, 
uh, mm -hmm. the, the kinds of breakdown and degradation of film and formatting that occurs in older technologies. Mm -hmm. Amazing, yeah. <laughs> what a sobering, fascinating lesson in, in history. And you're also reminding us that one of the things that Haystack is most committed to is not making the dialogue driven from technology to humanities, but also raising questions about whether humanities can be asking the questions that surround it. You're also reminding me that the largest attendance we ever had in the Digital Humanities Collaboratory events when we were running it as an events-based activity was for the rollout of the digital management system. We had 47 people show up. Sherry will remember it well because she assisted with that. Um, one quick burning question so we make sure that we have enough time for the others. Anybody want to ask one now or maybe wait? Joan, I've thought about you at a number of points here during this presentation. Yeah, yeah. I have questions, but I'll wait till the okay. end so everyone has That's great. Time to well, speak. let me in introduce them. Then came with proper embarrassing praise. Um, you said something excellent so when you talked about rhetoric being a, a major part of <clears throat> what you see as the essence of all the implications of what you were talking about. And so here we have someone not only in rhetoric, but I met Kim when she approached me, her dissertation director, if I recall this, if I reconstruct this correctly, said, well, you know, it would be really good if you're going down on the job market if you had a letter from somebody in digital humanities. So she remembered that. So she approached me, and I, I thought, well, you know, that's nice, but I don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so glad I didn't say, I don't know you, so I can't do this. I said, I'd have to read your work first. And then I read your work, and I was just, bowled over is the Brits say gobsmacked by really the brilliance of what you're doing, the, the level of thought you're bringing, and a conversation that's going on with a lot of people in rhetoric today about what do we think about rhetoric historically and, and the implications that digital media to bring to it. So um, I was just delighted that I didn't say no, and you've been a very generous mentor to others too in, in the job process, and I'm very happy to say that Kim is a follow-up to Walter's, we'll embarrass you again, follow-up to Walter's introduction as Kim went off to Saginaw Valley State College on a one-year instructorship with maybe the possibility of an assistant professorship on a tenure track and they were so bowled away by her that she is now an assistant professor at Saginaw Valley State and it's just really <laughs> making her way so Really great to have you here, and you are our first representative of something that excited us tremendously, Haystack, having the online forum. So I'll let you take over. Sure. Uh, thank you. And I'm glad you didn't say no. Yeah. <laughs> I don't because know now you. we have this great relationship, and I'm so thankful <laughs> for that. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the forum, and Sherry will be able to talk about her forum as well, but I do yeah. want to mention um, that I am speaking for Mary Carter as well, who can't be with us. Uh, but she and I were co-hosts along with two other people who I'll talk about in just a bit. Uh, if we could uh, these are our co-hosts. Uh, but what a forum actually is, is um, it's a gathering of initially several different people from different universities who are all, who are all Haystack scholars. And what we did was we came up with a topic that we were all interested in and we had a lot of questions about that we wanted to really bring to the Haystack community, and we wanted to see who else was out there had been thinking about these kind of topics, and by no means did we want to search for answers. The, really the, the point of the Haystack Forum is really to bring up questions, to bring up conversations. Uh, and the way that I like to describe it is it's this extended digital conference, uh, in between the conference presentation, you know, the, the hallway talk, like that's really what these are, you know, we, this sounds really cool to me, or oh, that really sparks something in my mind that I want to learn more about. And so we would carry on this conversation for anybody who wanted to participate. And so, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, we worked actually, go back, sorry. Uh, Mary and I worked with uh, both Lindsay Thomas and Dana Solomon, both of them from UC Santa Barbara. And we don't know each other. Uh, we only collaborated digitally. Uh, we had several Skype meetings. Uh, we you know, set up Google Docs and all sorts of different collaborative technologies were used to put this forum together. Uh, and it was a really great environment to actually, you know, practice what we preach a lot in digital humanities, to actually go out there and do collaborative work using the different technologies that we always talk about. 
Uh, and one of the great things that actually Julie mentioned of being on the job market is using this sort of collaboration uh, in conversation with everybody uh, about PSAC. And so I was able to talk about how you know putting together this forum and really getting to know people uh, digitally uh, as opposed to working you know face to face really brought out a lot of admiration from a lot of people on the job market. But also everybody kind of had that feeling like oh. I you know, I wanted to do that, but I was kind of hesitant about that. How'd that work? Uh, so I was able to talk about that, but also it brought out a lot of people who had already done a lot of digital work. For example, someone that I currently work with is working on a, or has just finished a graphic novel and never met his illustrator, and they had only collaborated digitally. And so he's like, you know, we were able to have this conversation of how that actually works and the troubles and the triumphs of all that, um, the different collaborations. So what I want to do is just kind of roll through some of the discussion that we had during our forum, uh, what our forum was actually about, and then some of the questions that we raised, and then some of the interesting comments uh, from some of our uh, co-hosts. So, uh, and this is a, an image from the Body World exhibit where you may have seen that you know, it's been traveling all over the world, and there's been different um, exhibits, but we're at the, the body itself and trying to just see like, the, mus the muscles and the bones and all, that, all the different parts of the body. Uh, either in motion or just in different stages. Uh, so first exhibited in Tokyo in 1995 and 97, German uh, anatomist uh, Gunter von Hagen's uh, Body World exhibit has since been shown in over 50 venues throughout Asia, Europe, and North America, making one of the most successful travel traveling exhibitions ever. Von Hagen's, who patented, it, patented the plastination process used to preserve the bodies in the exhibitions, has commented that the Body World has been so popular because it fills a longing for the authentic in a time of practically unlimited reproducibility. The exhibits feature plastic humans and sometimes animal bodies and body parts arranged around a central theme. Uh, and as such, Von Hagen's dead bodies highlight the ways in which media and mediation can be brought to bear on the biological. So this idea of the plastic body was something that all of us became interested in. We're like, this is really the critical combination of media, of art, of technology, of biology, and what, what is this doing? Uh, and so we thought it was just a great forum for the for, uh, Haystack because we have people from all those different fields and we have all uh, interests from all those different fields ready to talk about it. Uh, and then as we did a little bit more research and we were talking to each other, we realized that using that word medium or media is a really fraught word. And that if we were going to talk to biologists, if we were going to talk to artists, if we were going to talk to other people doing technology studies, that we had to understand that it's very different for everybody. So for example, in media studies, flip, good. Uh, in media studies, uh, it's a way in which we transmit and store information. So technology such as books, radio, television, t computers. In biology, a medium is a surrounding environment in which something functions and thrives, the broth in which E. coli bacteria grow in a laboratory. Uh, in art, the medium or media refers to the substance that the artist uses to create his or her art, or things, marble, ceramics. Von Hagen's exhibits activate all of these understandings of medium in problematic and interesting ways. Where does Von Hagen's get the materials for his medium of composition? Do dead bodies store and or transmit information? Do they provide an environment of sorts? How are they as Von Hagen's maintains examples of authentic rather than re reproducible, reproducible media? Okay. Activating these questions, Body Worlds nicely encapsulates the central theme of this forum, the mediation of life, death, and all matters in between. And so we took to asking some larger questions uh, in our forum. Uh, and we can, I want to just ask, show you a couple of these questions, but I also want to say that one of the greatest things, again, about hosting a forum is that not only do you get to work with and converse with other people, other Haystack scholars, but you have like the geeky opportunity as a grad student to really go out there and contact some of these people that are doing great things in the field and that you always admire because they will be guest uh, speakers in such a way. So we actually had um, some of our speakers that we had join us. But um, actually, we asked Donna Haraway if she would join us, and or I'm sorry, uh, Catherine Hales, excuse me. Uh, and she said no, but here, you know what? Contact this person. I know she would be great. And at first, I was like. She wrote me back. Um, <laughs> and so Sarah Franklin from the London School of Economics and Political Science, Colin Milburn from the University of California, Davis, 
Robert Mitchell from Duke University, Juicy Marika, who actually came here a couple years ago, uh, from uh, Anguilla Ruskin University, uh, and Adam Zaretsky, a bioartist, who's associated with Rensselaer Polytech. Uh, so we had all these great people from all different fields really participating and joining the conversation, and, and it was just a wonderful experience. And some of the larger questions that we introduced um, at the start of our uh, forum um, these were some of them. What does the intersection of media studies and science and technology studies bring to the humanities? What do the humanities do for these disciplines? What are the roles of media, archaeology, and of the history of science and technology in this intersection? What is biomedia? How can we understand life as a transmission of storage and information? Um, what are understandings of materiality are at play in the mediation of life, life itself? What is the role of the human in these intersections, of the animal or insect, or of the non-living? How can we incorporate the intersections of media studies and science and technology studies into the classroom? What texts and methodologies should we teach? Uh, and so we can see that all of these questions, again, it, it really opened up a conversation, not looking to come to any conclusion, but really to start a generative conversation. Uh, and I just want to read through a couple of comments that we received, because I think they're just so interesting and really demonstrate that conversation. So Rob Mitchell, uh, wrote around the middle of the 19th century, the term medium seems to have undergone a disciplinary mitosis, again, using kind of the idea of science technology, that one that parts out life and culture to different fields of knowledge production. So for example, a, a biologist would say, well, once you have the cell separated, then you need to place it in media. And he or she would show me an orange bottle of fluid, or sometimes a semi-opaque layer at the bottom of a petri dish. It was the use of this term media or rather the apparent difference between this understanding of media and my own humanities social science understanding of media that initially encouraged me to investigate the history of the term. Adam Zarefsky, the bioartist, who does these really interesting projects where uh, he, he has his students bring in any sort of living thing and they literally they throw them in a blender and they mix them all up and then they talk about what is this now? Uh, so it's these creepy sort of experiences. Some of them creepy. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, uh, I mean, the plants and you know, whatever they have, and it's. I, I know. Science, <laughs> Boom, there it is. Science yeah. experiment. Uh, he, uh, uh, he, he is like that, and he would not hesitate. And it's a very strange ethical way he, he actually teaches um, bioethics, and he teaches a lot of pre med students, and he uses these experiments to talk about those sort of boundaries. Anyway, so he, he said, by comparing the new media employed to present to bio, biologize subjects as art, bioart has a final of emphasizing both the blatant politics and the infectious discomfort these arts target toward a mediation of human cultural interface. And if the medium is the social, what are the antisocial or sociopathic media, all of which seems to be so replicative or mimetic? Uh, Mary uh, brought up a great conversation about viral and virus and the concept borrowed from biology that can only exist and propagate in, digital, in a digital environment. We talk about viral media, such as viral videos, internet memes, computer viruses infecting people and computers alike and spreading contagious epidemics. She also talked about Richard Dawkins' uh, idea of the digital meme carried by a bi biological host, such as the human brain. Um, there was this fascinating conversation um, between Dana Solomon, uh, Jesse Perica, and Rob Mitchell about necropolitics. The idea that another necropolitical necro aspect of these exhibits seemed to center on the fact of the exhibition itself and the old polit political problem of representations. That these aren't just representations, but that they're re-representations of these bodies. Uh, and then Colin Milburn added to that, saying the necropolitical turn of the discussion seems to be quite seductive, and it can certainly open several powerful ways of conceiving the relations between media and life, scientific practice and cultural representations, technology and art, and the idea that says, the dead is never really dead, but filled with life. And then also, we were fortunate enough to have Kathy Davis, uh, who Julie mentioned earlier, actually participated in our forum as well. And she said that she was using a lot of our conversations in her classroom mm -hmm. um, about her brain, or, this is your brain on the internet. Student run peer assessed peer led class. Two students chose AI as a topic, and we had a terrifically interesting conversation about the Turing test and its lack of a body. Um, and so it was great to hear her say, you know, I don't really know much about this. She, she had this little preamble to what she just said there. But I really want to participate, and I'm really learning a lot from you. And so we have those conversations where, you know, everybody's an expert in their own ways, and they're willing to learn and willing to participate at their own expertise. And so 
hearing all these people having this conversation and really chiming in with what they could was is such a powerful mm -hmm. um, instance of what HACEP is really all about. So uh, that's what I have to say about my experience uh, working with this HACEP forum. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any of those questions. Um, I know we have to move on to Sherry, so um, put a pause in those questions. But you've just given powerful testimony to what the forums could become, and people will sometimes ask us at Haystack, how can I join? You put on the website, so I did. Yeah. What, what do you do? Whatever you want to do. Yeah, and you don't have to be a Haystack scholar to actually participate. We had several people that were exactly. scholars that were participating exactly. in the forum. Yeah, and it was very much about creating not only a new kind of community, but I'm thinking of something you said, Ian, as well, that it's about marrying thinking and doing, and doing and having an experimental space to do things, and then becoming a model for others who might like to try it as well. So that's just um, extremely powerful. And Sherry gives us a, a wonderful closing example of another kind of forum. Actually, we've only had five Haystack scholars at Wayne State. And three of them have been involved in the online forum, something for us to be very proud of. So I first met Sherry when she was a student in the Interdisciplinary Studies program. Sherry is Canadian by origin, where you get a three-year bachelor's degree. But if you want to go to grad school in the US, you have to cap off a fourth year somewhere. So she was capping off a fourth year, taking anything she wanted. I thought that was just really <laughs> cool. And wound up in a couple of my classes, including a historiography class. And what I learned over time was that she had a deep and abiding interest in digital history. So the fact that you got to participate in a digital history online forum was just incredibly cool. And you really were the bedrock for us of the events version of the Digital Humanities Collaboratory, because Sherry did all the work of mocking up the flyers, arranging the events, making sure things went smoothly, and just that, that wouldn't have happened without you. So you're sort of, you've been glorious to know on a couple of levels there, but go ahead and tell us what your experience has been. Yeah. And the hardest part of the digital humanities was keeping up with Julie. <laughs> sure. Yes. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Absolutely. She responds to emails faster than you can have them out. <laughs> I know. If I've, got a, on it. if I've got a connection that's working. <laughs> I don't think it matters. <laughs> <laughs> you set ready. the bar a little high. <laughs> Yes, Dr. Edwards, Julie, thank you. Um, I was one of the co-hosts of a virtual conference in 2009. There were two other co-hosts. I can do that. I'm close enough, aren't I? You're actually take over the air now. Um, the, the object, the purpose of the virtual conference was to expose scholar and educational institutes to show them new and productive ways of thinking about the relationship between storytelling and digital technology. My co-hosts were Anna Bolaventura from the University of Texas in Austin. Her field of interest is the community empowerment of digital stories. She's working with the National University designing a curriculum of digital storytelling on Second Life. And she's also a member of the European Union Pestazoli program. Anna creates modules on Mojo, mobile citizenship, citizen journalism as part of a collection on media literacy and human rights. Jeff Watson didn't show up very well, but he's from the US, the University of Southern California School of Cinematic Art. He's a screenwriter and a filmmaker, and Jeff is investigating how mobile, interoperable communication infrastructure enables new forms, that's like yours, new forms of storytelling and social engagement. I was in the teaching and learning area, and I was interested in the role that digital stories could play in academic libraries. Um, they can do a lot of things. The librarians can work as an interdepartment collaboration with other departments. They can teach, do oral histories of faculty, students, community, create an archive, a historical archive. There's a lot they can do. And just as a by note, just on the side, I did an oral history two, a month ago of a lady who is French. She was 12 years old when the Germans invaded France in 1940. And I did a two-hour oral history of her, and it was fascinating, the stories, her father in the resistance, her and her mother fleeing. <clears throat> so in times to come, that's going to, well, not only for her family, but just as a historical thing. Um, 
we started talking about what is the definition. There is no accepted definition. Uh, the Center for Digital Storytelling, they say, well, every story should have seven elements. The author's point of view, the dramatic question, what are you answering with this story? The emotional content. They call it the gift of your voice, meaning you personalize the story. The power of the soundtrack, anybody who's ever seen a movie, when the, mood, the music goes very loud, you know there's something dramatic coming. And the economy, keeping the story about the story, and then the pacing. Leslie Rule from the Story Center says, oh, no, 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 it's just basically a modern expression of the ancient art of storytelling. And digital storytelling just gives a deeper dimension, more vivid color to the characters and the situations, etc. Daniel Meadows is a British digital storyteller, and his definition is they're short, personal, multimedia tales told from the heart. He, he doesn't get too into finite definitions. But however you define digital stories, they are providing amazing versatility. And they're being used in a multitude of ways in diverse fields that maybe wouldn't normally come together. Um, here are some of the highlights we did talk about during the forum. We talked about digital storytelling and activism. The lady from the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition, I invited her to join the forum, and she did. And she was fascinating. Michigan Disability Rights Coalition were very early to jump on what digital stories can do. They're using digital stories to influence the government, educate the public, raise funds, and to lift the self-esteem of the disabled. And their digital stories are posted on YouTube, so it can reach a wider audience. But they're doing a really, really good job. Anne-Marie Armstrong introduced us. She was one of the contributors to the forum. Anne-Marie offered us the Tiziano Project. And they are, are working with digital stories in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, and they're providing community members in conflict, post-conflict, and underreported regions with equipment, training, and the affiliations necessary to report their stories, get their stories out, and hopefully improve their lives. And that's the Tiziano Project. Digital storytelling is having a huge impact on the health field. I had no idea. One website called Sidewalk Radio, lists them, this is how they, they have it listed on their website, anthropology as a resource to promote health, labor rights, and visual media. Now the picture on there is based on a digital story about Malawian tobacco farmers that they're, that they're trying to convince them to grow maize. That growing maize will provide more food and more profit than tobacco, which is what they now produce. And hopefully it will return them to hope and help them out of privacy. A Belgian group did the digital story in Malawi, but then finding even another use for it, they took the digital story back to Belgium and they're showing it to teenagers to show them that smoking is bad not only for your body, but as a world citizen. So they're trying to give them more reasons not to smoke. One of the authors of um, a digital guide, a digital storytelling, a guide for academic libraries. Anne Fields, I, I asked her to join the forum and she did. But what she told us, I thought she would be talking more about libraries, but what she told us about was how at Ohio State, they're using digital stories at the Suicide Prevention Center to help students. And what they do, you were talking about collaborations that you wouldn't normally think. They're bringing together storytellers mental health experts, and technology facilitators, teaching people how to use the software to tell their story. And they're creating wonderful stories to help not only suicide survivors, but families of suicide victims, and hopefully creating a public awareness of suicide and all the effects and what can happen. But that's what Ohio State has found to do with digital stories, which I thought was a great use of a digital story. They're using them immensely in children's health. One of the contributors, Dr. Yuri Quintana of St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, 
he was telling us about how they're creating they're creating digital stories for children, their parents, their teachers, their health care providers. And what they're doing is they're creating stories to educate, but they're also telling children, they're hoping to show children about cancer, empathy, grief, and related topics. There's one where it goes into what's a cell, what's the blood system, and they're, they're age appropriate. And they're working with that a lot. Now in the bottom, this is another lady from USC, the School of Cinematic Arts, Mary Antina Gotsis. She created an interactive character called Pluff <laughs> for children with autism. And what they're doing is they're using inexpensive flip cameras that allow the children to tell their stories in a way they can. So that's an interesting use, <clears throat> I thought, of digital storytelling. And my own favorite. Oral history. Yeah. That's yeah. That's my area of interest. Um, there's a something called the Museum of the Person. They're in Brazil, Portugal, U.S., and Canada, and it links individuals and groups through authoring and sharing their stories. You can go and read the stories. You can tell your story, and what they want to do. Here's their mission statement: to create a more just and democratic world built on the memory of persons from all segments of society. So people who in the past maybe couldn't get the word out or get their story out, with digital storytelling and access that everyone has, it's really spreading, so that's good. Digital storytelling is being used to preserve cultures. One of the co-hosts, Jeff Watson, told us about the whale hunt, and he asked, if, well, his question in the forum was, can this kind of database art be considered storytelling? Yeah, I think it can, I really do. Um, click on it, I'm gonna just briefly show it to you. Whoops, I wanna go oh, back. Pause. Ian's in charge of the internet today. I thought this was fascinating. It fascinated me, but I'm easily amused. Oh. You are, you need to skip it down. Oh. If you can. You can click anywhere on the mosaic. Look at the time in the upper right. It is a whale hunt from beginning to end. It shows you time frames. Mm -hmm. This is up in the Arctic Circle. Down in the bottom, I don't know if we can reach it, you can pause, but you can also go back, yeah, you can go back to the mosaic. That's okay. Now, you can scan anywhere in the mosaic. You can start your story anywhere. You can, don't go to the red part, that's the whale. I was going to warn you about that. <laughs> I was purposely staying away from the red part. Yeah, don't go there. Um, <laughs> But this provides an ability of a story not to be linear. Mm. I mean, I can't even think of all the ways you could use this kind of database yeah. art. I can't even imagine. But it is the story, and it's time. And you can pause at any time you want and so forth. But mm. that's the whale hunt. Which, I, yes, I do consider that digital storytelling, of course. Now, another one of our contributors, Biagio Oropa, was, is still preserving the Lakota Native American language, stories, culture, through digital stories. He's, he's doing a lot of that. No, no, just the next slide. And also, digital storytelling is used in urban s stories. As Andy was pointing out, that picture in itself could be considered a digital story. Hyper cities, um, they look at the layered histories of cities and global spaces, and they use Google Map, Google Earth, and it essentially allows users to go back in time to create and explore the historical layers of cities, spaces, and interactive hypermedia. And they have Hypercity Berlin, Hypercity. Hermione, I must tell you, Hermione paired me with a um, Spanish diplomat stationed in Cairo during the revolution. I was researching, he was writing a book and I was helping him research it. I actually sent Pedro an email 
and I said, have you looked at Hyper Cities, Egypt? And he's in the midst of a revolution. And he went there, and I got this lovely email back from him, and his response was, that is really globalization. And he was in the middle of the revolution, but he watched it on Hyper Cities. So there was a case. And we also, Jeff Watson brought up augmented reality applications like Layer. You see a poster on the wall, you can put it up, buy the tickets. Very location specific. There were so many topics covered or discussed in the forum, you couldn't cover them all. You can see. Goodness. These were all, at one point or another, brought up during the, during the digital story. Uh, it was fascinating. It was absolutely fascinating. And just what you had said, Kim, you, you learn about things you never would have found out about any other way, or people doing work you had never even thought about. Yeah, it was fascinating. Even using comics and digital storytelling. And, but yes, it was fascinating. And that's it for me. And that was fascinating, my goodness. Um, it's, it, this is a wonderful room. Magic happens in this room. And we've come together today to experience some extraordinary scholars. Just extraordinary. I want to live in a future that has you in it. And I want the future to look like that. That's just absolutely astonishing. And Emily, if we might coordinate with you later, we'd like to blog this to the Haystack website. <clears throat> so to spread the word even further, we've been interested lately in featuring stories at Haystack about uh, off the website about what's happening on campus. And I said, well, we've got something coming up. And this is just fantastic. We have to share this. It's remarkable to think of how far we've gone from the point that Walter was birthing us here in 2006 when we had the working group and it evolved into the collaboratory and its events and Dini and I are starting to talk now about what might happen in the future as well and I'm very pleased to say that Wayne State University is offering the first graduate seminar on digital humanities in the fall. An 8,000 level theory course in the English department. So it's some things take the patience of the proverbial Joe, but that's a pretty good six year run there. And now I know, Joan, you want to ask a question. I bet you do as well. So let me throw it open to you. Um, well, first, thank you. I'm sorry I missed the, the first one. It was an interesting paper. Um, Ian, first, I just want to say thank you for bringing attention to images in. Yeah the digital humanities, because it really isn't an area that's very well represented, unfortunately. Um, let's see, what did I, I have a few notes here. Um, one of the things that I wrote down um, that I made a note about is, I don't know if you heard about this, it happened, geez, uh, it was about three weeks ago, it was in The Guardian, uh, this happened also last year at the Courtauld. They have these amazing photographic collections that are in various and sundry museums um, in the UK. And they literally just decide, oh, well, we don't need them anymore. And they went to throw them away. And one of them actually in the Victoria and Albert Museum was sent to the dump. Like literally hundreds of thousands of photographic images that document their own collections that had never been digitized. So I think that's a real, it's just such a horrific situation that museums who are supposed to be like the keepers of cultural materials just decide because we have this newer technology, you know, there's some, <laughs> some level in the administration just decides well, it's taking up space and we really need that space, let's just get rid of it. And there was one that, the Victorian Albert had been dumped completely, it was just gone. And I can't remember the name of the museum that it happened to where there was some low level employee called, um, is it a Mellon Foundation in, that's based in London. And they literally had the boxes next to the dumpster and they drove up with a van and they took literally hundreds of boxes of black and white, essentially, black and white photographs of uh, their collection and took them. Thankfully, someone got them. So I think, you know, it's an issue. People don't really think that images have much worth. And since digital images are so easy to, 
you know, come by and there's millions on the internet, we just think that, well, we have it already. Well, that's not the case. And so, you know, uh, analog collections are just being tossed. Um, oh, I, I wanted to make a comment about the photosynth, you know, the query by image content. It's really, it's fabulous and it does really sexy things on the screen, but in terms of uh, scholars actually being, being able to use it, it's at such a coarse level at this point that it's not useful. Um, it is useful for people like architects who are, want to pick out like interior, you know, fabrics and floor designs and that type of thing. Yeah, you know, but there's also the issue I think of like mm -hmm. one company choosing yeah. the answer to your question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it'll get there. And one thing I don't think that they're doing very well into, the development of these systems basically stopped about 10 years ago. I think the time and money that had to be poured into them, they saw that they could only reach a particular level and then interest in them basically stopped about, I don't know, 2000, um, But it may be a combination system where you using terms and this kind of uh, query by image content so that yes, you can pull up all of Notre Dame's images, but then there needs to be clusters of ways for people to be able to get at those images because if you see 10,000 images of Notre Dame, that's, you know, that's a lot of images to see at once and there has to be a way to kind of sort them in a way that makes sense. That's something that I know when I uh, did my dissertation, that was something that the scholars that I talked to really had a difficult time with. Yeah. yeah to, to touch on the, the photosynth observation, I absolutely agree 100%. I mean, that, that's, that's programmers doing ac aerial acrobatics and saying, look, and they're like, what are we supposed to do? You know, <laughs> this isn't in any kind of human scale. Um, and, that's, and, that's, and that's why I think it's so important that they, people involved in the humanities uh, a, develop the skills to be able to engage in a meaningful fashion with this kind of technology and, and create the way that it, that it develops. Um, just letting programmers go wild is, 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 not, you know, is not necessarily the answer. I mean, it, and it, you know, sometimes it, it does look good in a, in a six minute demonstration, but what do you, what do, you do with it when those, uh, those images are not, uh, they don't have any meaningful metadata attached to them in a permanent fashion that's able to be accessed through multiple systems that are, are being kind of used almost universally. You know, that this is this is where, where we're at right now. We have so much information, visual data, whatever it is, that we're completely bombarded and we're, we're almost going back to saying, you know what? Let's let's gain the sanctuary of this glass slide. <laughs> you know, this glass this is something I can I can I can attach myself to. Um, but 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 that's definitely uh, work that I'm doing right now. I just I just started a research project on finding out um, across museums like what kind of holdings are they actually sitting on on these these things. And, and I think a lot of those are the um, I almost brought some in. We have tens of thousands of them lantern down slide. over there. Is those like the old old lantern slides? I mean, it's just very labor intensive to to scan these things and to catalog them in a meaningful fashion. And then what? There's not really a good cross kind of platform um, software way to access these things yet. I think right now this is the work that I think is meaningful like, to me and just some of the other people in the like the, the information systems is like how do we make this in a way that, that humans can actually use these things. Um, this is, uh, Ross here, he, 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 he knows exactly what you're talking about. I think about you know, dumpsters, you know, next to the dumpsters, the images. He was telling me a story about how he I was mean, archivist at Ford, and they just, and the, you know, and, and they, they, they were just, they just you know, ch chucking out. things, too, you know. I, this, this was in, this, all these Kodachrome slides in this cute box, all this, this, this was in a pile going to the dumpster, you know, but it's, can you devote the resources? And is it, is it, is the payoff there? I mean, it costs at you know about almost ten dollars per image to, to to get it digital. You know, mm -hmm. that's then that's in a pretty efficient workflow. Mm -hmm. Is 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 the museum funding there for that when they can't keep the doors open? 
you know, and so, oh, yeah. and so five, how does that work? Five years ago at, at Ford, the thinking had gotten to the most uh, effective way of storing the company's information was on negative. Be because nobody's going to have Windows 95 in 2040 when the court case comes up because we didn't know that this chemical was a problem. <laughs> And they have to get the, you know, they have to get the files on that to show who was exposed to it in the plan. Mm -hmm. uh, the only way to assess the in information is, uh, you know, a negative, not digitally. And there's another implication, of it's rather gripping. I'm judging for the National Endowment for the Humanities, and initially when there was a lot of interest, there was money for digitization with IMLS too. But now, since it, the expectation is that we'll get it digitized anyway through some other pot of money, and so there's an imperative to have grants focus on other categories. But there's just so much that's lost then. As you and your example is very gripping, but then it just has it just defies the notion of permanence. It defies the notion of ubiquity. I, mean, I can't believe it when I sit in a room and somebody says, "Well, everything will be available digitally." No, it will not. And, and, you know, in, in 600 years, somebody finds a, yeah. a, a disco record. You can make you can make a record player pretty easily. <laughs> you can't make a DVD. That's record. an excellent point. Yeah. There, I was thinking of some parallels as we were getting the presentations today. A number of parallels to music, well, particularly when you were talking about how what happens, you know, when the, you have a shift over there in the yeah. medium, and then, yeah, it's becoming such a problem. I'm in my digital humanities seminar. I want to teach Patchwork Girl. It's in story space reader on a CD-ROM that I can't play on any of the machines on campus anymore. And the only reason I used to be able to play it was because I kept my OS 10. But when I upgraded, <laughs> so much for teaching story space reader. And there goes the history of early electronic literature and the access. Yeah. Uh, did you have something you uh, My question around. goes to, to Andy mm -hmm. uh, about well, we have the mural there, with the, the, and once you take that one from the real context and you put it in a museum for preservation, for sharing, and so on, you lose the experience, the context, the physical context. Mm -hmm. So have they taken only the mural or the, the boulders, the, the, the trash around? Yeah. Because that's once you see it in a museum setting, it's the flavor is gone. Yeah, so, absolutely. So what do you, what do, what does museum work do in order to preserve the context itself and to, to keep the experience? Yeah, well, I think that's one of the, the biggest things that's interesting to me about this, this piece is that they did none of that. You know, they, they kept none of the rubble. Okay. The, the wall is like bounded by a piece of steel. Now, mm -hmm. otherwise it's going to fall apart, right? Like, um, like it's for you. Yeah, like it's framed. It, it looked like they repaired part of it too. Yeah, I think it, it got damaged as they were taking it apart, so they had to like kind of fix it up a little bit. So, um, and and it's that it's that whole like, and yet they're preserving it because it's part of like Detroit's history or something. But they've completely decontextualized yeah, it, and exactly. you know, yeah. and, and, and so you see an exhibit. Yes, <laughs> and and whereas you know, here's this piece of graffiti, and graffiti is this very ephemeral uh, medium. It's supposed to be written over by you know, and I'm sure Banksy would have not cared or been happy if someone had written over it or tagged over it or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and and yet it wasn't it wasn't accessible. It was only really identified online because there weren't enough people, um, you know, maybe other graffiti artists, but there weren't really a lot of people in the factory space to see it there, right? And so you have that kind of attention as well. And so um, wasn't, it, wasn't there a controversy about that they did it for a profit too? Oh, and it was in a gallery. It was a, it was in a gallery space. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so it wasn't necessarily for preserving it. It was for profiting from it. Oh, okay. I think. Well, and that's where your challenge of look at these three different kinds of spaces and think about what the implications are of being in one of those spaces rather than another. That's Absolutely. And, and yet using this, yeah. this piece to sort of connect all those different spaces and kind of mm -hmm. um, ask questions that you wouldn't even, mm -hmm. even think to consider when you think of it, you know, in just this one small space. Yeah. Mm. If I could follow up a little bit, there's there's kind of a similar uh, project at, at play at the DIA right now, 
with um, the photography exhibit, Detroit right. Revealed, yeah. where um, mm -hmm. Scott Hawking and some others have, have their work that, uh, and Scott, a lot of Scott's work from that show is at the Packard plant as, as well, which is, I think they're slated for demolition now. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, yeah. I drove by there and there must have been 30 people, just like, te it was teeming with hipsters with cameras, just <laughs> just like trying to, you know, consume this thing before it's gone. But um, the solution that the DIA has been kind of, has chosen is, has been to have like a, a 3D kind of panoramic kind of walk through of the, the Packard plant to accompany, you know, some of the photographs of it. So I mean, it, 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 that's the major problem is, 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 is context and is it meaningful at all? And for the 2013 Arts of the President's Conference, we will be over in the DIA for part of the time and just to show you how this, this comes to a point of, of quasi-completion, it'll even be a ruins tour. <laughs> so, and a discussion of ruins porn as it there well should be. Detroit hard hats. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Well, we'll all wear our t-shirts. Um, any other final comments? Or you're welcome also to talk with the individuals, but we definitely will, if we can, Emily and Walter coordinate with you to blog this on the Haystack National website and give the international website and give plenty of credit to the Humanities Center for thank you so much for hosting us today.